Hey gang, welcome to Ozone Late Night. This is part one of my conversation with Paris Martineau, investigative reporter and feature writer over at The Information. everybody welcome to another installment of ozone late night joining me for this edition episode segment whatever is paris martineau a feature writer and investigative reporter for the information paris has previously worked for wired the outline as well as one of my favorite magazines new york magazine which i actually still have a physical subscription to Uh, you can i know i know because i'm old that's why and i like to read physical things uh, you can also see and hear Paris every week as part of This Week in Google over on the twit.tv network. Also, the first guest I've ever had who got a company shut down, and I'm pretty sure, at least intentionally. Uh, and you can find more info about Paris over at parismartino.com. Paris, welcome to Ozone Late Night, and thank you for being here. Thanks so much for having me. I also have a print subscription to New York Magazine, so we're in good company. God, I love New York Magazine. I it's just the perfect magazine. I've it really got some is. Old ones from the '60s sitting next to me right now. Yeah. Fantastic. Oh man, I love old magazines. Old magazines, old type, and all that stuff. I old ads. I have a couple of the. I don't remember who makes the books, but they're ads of the whatever decades, and I love all that stuff. I just like to see how everything has changed within. Because you know, I'm older, so I, I remember physical media and all that stuff. They have a. They have a name for my my not besides the Generation X thing, but there's something else for people who grew up without persistent internet. There's some kind of not digital natives, I guess is like my sister who's eight Yeah, years like the, uh, I guess like adaptation to the digital something world. Something like that, where I can actually have my cell phone away from me and not start to feverishly twitch for, you know, an hour. Yeah, I was thinking about it the other day. I was like, can't remember the last time I was away from a phone or computer for longer than an hour or two. Well, our, it's probably our... not great. There was a massive, not not where we were, it wasn't that bad, but there was a windstorm up here because there was an atmospheric river because the climate is... Oh, yeah, I saw it took down Twit Studios, famously. Yeah, and so we were without internet for 24 hours, and I thought, you know, I don't really care, I'm fine, it doesn't really matter to me, it was it was okay, I, I read and I drew stuff, and I was, and I thought, I don't know if my sister could hold up this well, because... Wait, fu- so fine. fully without internet and, I mean, did you have cell service? Yeah, but I mean, I didn't even... Okay, then that doesn't count. Well, okay, oh, but I wasn't doing... I My cell phone, I was like, if I have an emergency, I can call somebody. But I didn't have it. I didn't I didn't use it. It was there in case, you know, if there's an emergency, of course. I'm not going to, you know, throw my cell phone into a Faraday cage and pretend that I'm living in the middle of a mountain and start sending pipe bombs to people. I'm not that type of person, but... <laughs> Listen, you could I always figured, try. Yeah. I, I, I just like the fact that you know, sometimes it's nice to just not have stuff uh, internet for a little bit and and not worry about anything and just be able to do other things. So, um, but I understand that not everybody can do that. It's just, and I don't blame anybody. Some people get all judgmental. Oh, you can't go about yourself. If you grew up with that, then you you don't know. It's, it's tough to disconnect from something that you're saturated with. So I don't, you know, yeah. I mean, I love going, having a lazy Sunday or Saturday afternoon where I don't really look at my phone and just read all day. Uh, but I don't, you know, uh, I'm not saying I'm better than anybody for being able to do that or not being able to do that sometimes. I'm, I still think about the fact that Leo, uh, my co-host on This Week in Google, did a whole week retreat where all electronic devices were confiscated. And that wasn't even the point of it. I, I'm not sure I would want to do that. I think I would miss too many things. I I would guess... I don't know because I don't know Leo personally at all. I, I know him very vaguely through Twip from being a fan of the years and talking to him here and there. But I think that's also a generational thing where because he's he's even older than me, so he probably remembers a point where even, you know, TV wasn't necessarily 500 channels. And so when, when people do these digital detoxes, sometimes I, I take note of their age on how easy it is for them because I'm like, yeah, there's something, there's probably something nostalgic about not 
having to worry about alerts and notifications and who mentioned you where and all this stuff, it does become overwhelming. I understand people who, who get stressed out by it. I think some people mock that. Oh, it's well. incredibly stressful. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, it is a, it is a, another appendage of my body, but it's a very stressful appendage. Yeah. I, it, it's, a, it's like a lot of things. It's one of these amazing tools where when you realize how much power there is in a cell phone in terms of computing and information that, is incomparable throughout all of history but at the same time many of the things that run on this particular device i mean all computing devices but really the cell phone in a lot of ways unlike others and maybe in gaming there are so many things that are engineered to make you not ever want to stop looking at it because it's essentially a predatory system in many ways not necessarily by design well some of them are by design well yeah often by design because i mean every app be it a uh, you know a tech platform or a news app or something else it's typically measures success by like time on site or daily active users or daily active minutes it's maximizing for your attention and I, that may or may not be the best thing for you personally but that's beside the point you're just a number I know I read about one wellness app that that would notify you to be in the moment all the time. And I thought, mm, mm, I, mm, nope, I think they uh, I think they uh, misfired on that one because that's. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't seem right. Um, but let's talk about because I don't think I've ever I've ever talked. I don't think I've ever talked to somebody who's an actual journalist before. I'm pretty sure not. I normally talk to creative weirdos and, and whack jobs in the in like the artistic space. So I don't actually talk to somebody who. um I won't say I don't talk to professionals, but I don't think I've ever talked to a journalist before. <laughs> and I'm curious because you are quite a bit younger than me and you are in an industry that I, well, correct me. I guess I'll ask it. I'm, a, I'm saying this as if I know anything. I don't know shit. So I will just ask, uh, you know, what brought you, because normally when I talk to people, it's like 50, 50, some people knew what they want to do. They knew it. They did it. They, that's what they're doing. And the other half are like, well, I was uh, I was welding together car parts. And then somebody said, would you like to paint a mural? And then I knew I was a painter. It's like, oh, OK, well, that, that's quite a change. So how did you come into journalism? What brought you to journalism in general? Yeah, it's interesting. I was one of those kids that when I went into college, I knew exactly what I was going to do. Like they were going around. I remember like freshman year being like, oh, people, you'll change your mind about what you think you're going to do. And I was like, oh, bullshit. I'm not going to do that. And I was dead set that I was going to be a uh, going to go to med school and be a psychiatrist. I was like, I got it figured out. And then I took like one semester of pre-med classes and I was like, whoo. I was wrong. Uh, not the move for me. But I, um, I'd i always liked writing. And I remember at the time when I was thinking about what interested me about psychiatry, the medical field, I was thinking about like writing scientific journals and things like that. And I remember um, I went to school at NYU and I was like coming up the steps of the subway one time and a friend I like known since I was a child turned me and was like, totally apropos of nothing she was like Paris I always kind of thought you'd be a journalist and it was like the clouds opened up and the birds started singing and sunlight fell down on me and I realized like I think that is kind of what I want to do uh but at, even at the time I was like this is a terrible field to work in uh especially for a young know nothing at the time teenager uh probably an incredibly financially irresponsible decision that will lead to ruin so i was like i'm gonna give myself like five years or something see if i can make it work if not i guess i'll go to law school and uh turns out i'm quite good at it and i i was able to kind of get in a niche of tech journalism at a time when it was kind of a growing field within mainstream media. I uh, had a couple of internships in college uh, at CNN and then um, at New York Magazine was my first one where I could kind of write full time. Um, and I quickly, I, I was hired ostensibly to be a print, uh, like an intern on the print team, but I would get up, I was like, I want to write. I want to write for their tech section specifically. So I'd get up earlier in the, in the morning, do all of my print transcriptions, and then spend every single day from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. pitching the tech editor, uh, blogs and different feature ideas. And uh, we ended up becoming kind of fast friends. And he'd hired me to work in like a freelance capacity for a bit after that. Um, I don't think he... I think I've since found out that he didn't know at the time I was still technically in school. Uh, but I don't know. I wasn't telling him. I was like, I'm happy to have work in this industry. And uh, 
he ended up introducing me to some folks at this uh, site called The Outline. Um, because I, I would originally kind of planned to get a job at New York Mag, but something editorial wise, or I think budget wise fell through. But I ended up interviewing for a staff writer job at uh, this new website called The Outline and got it to be their uh, future staff writer, which is kind of a tech and science uh, desk. And I ended up taking that. It was my first full time gig in journalism and it really hit the ground running from there. So, and this is interesting too, because when you came into it, was that basically like the, uh, what do you call it? Like the golden rise of tech where everything was, oh yeah, you know, the tech's going to rule the world and blah, blah, blah. Or was it already sort of, at what It was, was right it? as it was starting to, I think we'd had kind of the period of tech's going to rule the world. These cool hacker kids are sitting in a dorm room, uh, you know, going to change everything. And things were starting to get a little wobbly. You know, people were like, hmm, maybe this isn't all it's cracked up to be and asking some questions. But most of the major news networks and uh, news organizations didn't have more than one or two tech reporters, if that. Uh, there really were, you know... Um, it was New York Mag, uh, The Verge, you know, your your general actual tech websites like CNET and Tech uh, Crunch and whatnot, of course, had tech bloggers. But it was just at a time when different outlets were starting to get hip to the idea of, hey, we should have Facebook reporters and Google reporters and whatnot and be building out these whole teams. Like I remember at the time that New York Times started hiring more, as did The Journal and Bloomberg. Uh and I ended up being kind of in the right place at the right time with the outline, um, which was, at the time was a, it ended up being a short-lived experiment in digital media, but it uh, was helmed by uh, Joshua Topolsky, um, formerly of uh, The Verge and This Is My Next and other stuff like that. So it had the attention of a lot of people in tech media. So... Uh, I've been lucky, unlucky enough to experience uh, two layoffs uh, already so far in my short media career. And the outline was my first. They laid off all their staff writers. Uh, but it was at the time when big layoffs in media were pretty unheard of. So immediately people in the tech and like tech journalism industry were itching to snap me up. And I ended up going to a Wired magazine after that where I worked for a couple of years, which was fantastic and got really into business and tech journalism and doing some more investigative stuff um and i did that for a couple of years until i was claimed by a condé nast media layoff which is the parent company of wired and then i ended up at the information which was definitely the most hard kind of beat reporting i've ever done i was originally the amazon reporter for a couple of years until i splintered off and doing feature and investigative work uh which is where i am now yeah, it, it, it does. There's times where I wonder if some of the reason that because it felt like there was the huge rise where tech was, you know, the, the next big thing and there could be no wrong. And then there was like a plateau period. And it always felt like to me that the plateau period, because now, of course, we're, we're seeing the other side of that was because really nobody was covering anything. Nobody knew how to cover it. So there wasn't anybody doing any real digging. And so all you were hearing was basically the marketing speak and the PR and the yeah, it's great. And yeah, yeah. we're going to deliver everything because nobody knew not only how to cover it, but what to even ask because it was all so new and it moved so quickly. That's what it felt like. And now, of course, we're, like I said, we're on the other side of that where now we're seeing that, oh, a lot of these people that did this stuff that move fast and break things. Yeah, there's kind of a downside to that, isn't it? Oh, wait, no, oh, people are getting just destroyed by this machine that everybody else is happy mm -hmm. to take for free and not thinking about, gee, I wonder why it's free. Why could it be free? Why is there a free thing in life that's delivering all this stuff? We shouldn't think about this too hard right now. We'll just accept that it's fine. And it feels like now, uh, you know, everywhere within, I mean, there's, this is the worst, is, is this gotta be the worst layoff year for tech in general? Is so yeah, far? ever. I mean, tech has been on a period of just like, infinite growth i guess since the dot-com boom and this is the first real puncture to that bubble and even then i mean it's still one of the largest most prosperous industries in the american economy it's interesting though because i think i think you're dead on the money with regards to the shifting uh opinions with the industry because it feels like obviously in the wake of like dot-com bubble bursting people thought of tech 
startups big and small as like this cute cool thing like look at these harvard uh students in their dorm room who are creating this fun social media website like look at this guy who's made a drone that will deliver blood to people in africa just like cute little human interest pieces or interesting novel business ideas that people in journalism and established positions were kind of uh, giving them a cute little pat in the head until all of a sudden, I think kind of the big turning point was around the 2016 election with everything that happened with Cambridge Analytica, as well as just a, there was a convalescence of a, a variety of different factors that suddenly newsrooms everywhere were looking for specific answers i think there was also everything going on in myanmar at the time and they were like and they decided to point the attack and they were like actually we've never investigated or put much uh effort into seriously interrogating these platforms that now undergird all of our existence i mean social media is how most of us communicate with the world and get our news it's part of people weren't really scrutinizing that until suddenly it was everywhere and everything yeah, in some ways, uh, Elon Musk's complete meltdown of, of Twitter, I will not call it by its other stupid name, of Twitter is actually... Right. <laughs> it's so, it's, I, it's man, that, the worst. <laughs> boy, you want, you want to talk about a figure who was deified only to reveal what he actually was all about. Um, I don't know that there is any... Is there a bigger poster child for the, the two-faced nature, and I refer to the Batman villain, which is one of my favorite villains of all time, the two-faced nature of tech, but Elon Musk, who on one side was, you know, you have to correctly attribute some of, if not a lot of, where electric vehicles are, thanks to his fervor for it, and of course SpaceX, but then on the other side, I don't know, it is one of the most toxic tech individuals around since a lot of them other ones are just off the map now, but he seems to be the one that still has a megaphone. But I feel like that's your example of, yeah, this is what it was everybody, at least for the most part. And we just didn't see it because we were too dazzled by, you know, magic reusable rockets and a car that, you know, could drive, well, not really itself, but was, was marketed <laughs> that way. And yeah. I feel like he's the, the ultimate example. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think he's the perfect example of like flew too close to the sun. I think it's also somewhat, I mean, it's all his fault in the sense that I, I wonder sometimes if we would have a similar opinion of other tech billionaires if they posted as much as Elon Musk. Like, I think that I always uh, joke among my friends about a concept I call CEO brain worms, which is I think when you rise to the level of prominence of being a CEO or founder of any company, especially one that raises tens of millions of dollars, if not hundreds of millions, something inside of you rots away. And uh, a place where a human used to be, some parts of it cease to exist just by the nature of that power. And I think when you get to a certain level of accumulation of power as these multi-billionaires that's certainly going to be amplified and elon musk is unique in the sense that he has always been a poster at heart he is always uh, shouting out whatever thoughts he has to the internet through twitter and other means so i think we have a particularly close look at the inner work of what is going on inside of his head and surprise surprise it's not all that brilliant but i wonder if we would also uh, feel the same about others if if we got a peek inside there. Oh, I, I just for myself, I think almost certainly because it's not as if there aren't very well known stories about like Steve Jobs and other people. And and to be fair, it's not just tech individuals. We shouldn't pretend it's only. Oh yeah, people. no, I'm sure you know everyone on Epstein's list. <laughs> well, that I mean, that, this is the thing is is I, I've I've talked with people about this to some extent where you know because. Before this, it was really sports celebrities were the ones that were known for this stuff where they would have these flip outs and you're like, well, what reality are they living in? And, and one of the things I would, would say is, well, these are people who have been around a lot of money and a lot of influence and nobody to tell them otherwise in many cases for a long time. And that's going to do something to you. It's not to absolve them of their bad behavior, because in most cases they had parents who I'm sure taught them right from wrong, at least in most cases. But if you. To, to use the most superficial example possible to, to, to you know, as something of pop culture, 
George Lucas made three films when nobody would say no to any of his bad ideas. And people wondered why they were miserable to get through. I'm sorry, 90s kids who are trying to reform the prequels. It ain't happening. It ain't happening. They suck. The scream of a thousand nerds is heard in the distance. You know, these fucking people sometimes, I'm like, I'm sorry, they're shit movies. They're just garbage. The the dialogue (laughs) is not something that four-year-olds would say to each other. and And but that, when you see the behind the scenes, Nobody's saying no to anything because they were like, well, this is a this is a huge uh, IP with a lot of money and everybody wants to see Star Wars come back. And so anything that George Lucas says, we're going to do. And this yeah. is the same thing. Nobody says no to you. Nobody says that might be the uh, not a good idea. W- what do we expect? These are all human beings. We pretend they're not, but they're human beings and human beings are susceptible to deciding that they're better than everybody because nobody tells them otherwise. So I don't. it seems inevitable to me. Absolutely. I mean, I think if I was thrown into a situation where over a period of years, no one said no to me and everyone was enabling my worst tendencies to extract some sort of value from their relationship with me, I would probably turn into a monster. Hopefully not a monster to the extent of uh, some of our luminary examples out there. But I think it's certainly a pressure cooker that even the best of us are probably incapable of avoiding. Well, you combine that also with the fact that because there was such a delay in and not only from investigative reporting, but also with legislation and regulation, which I know nobody wants to hear those words in America anymore, because apparently you say that and you're a communist or something. But the fact that a lot of these people have been able to wield a tremendous amount of power with really no checks, and it doesn't seem like there's going to be any real ones anytime soon. Where do you think this goes? Where does this end up? I mean, we're in the layoff period now, and that's going to be a lot of turbulence, but ultimately the companies themselves are not, there doesn't seem to be much changing within their structure. So what is the end result of this? Where do we end up? Because I can't figure it out for shit, but I'm a dummy, so I'll ask somebody who's smarter. I think the end result is sometime over the next couple of decades, probably. We will have, and I think we're starting to see a little bit of it, a major legislative shift happening on a global scale. I think if we look at even like antitrust law, it's had a a weakening over like the past 50 or so years towards the side of corporations, which has led to a lot of the kind of rampant uh, growth of various unchecked capitalist exploits uh, in the U.S. and elsewhere. Um And I think what is slowly but surely going to happen is a regulatory crackdown or at least the development of a more proactive regulatory body in the U.S. maybe in terms of like the FTC as well as like other legislative. But I say like a period of probably decades because right now it seems like under Lena Khan, even though she's trying her best, the FTC is not in a position to really enact much large scale change just because it doesn't seem like they have the manpower and just trying to work on Amazon alone is uh, pushing the agency to its limits, not to mention any of the other companies they need to also check. So I think it's like the beginning of a very large scale shift, which isn't a very satisfying answer because it feels like there should be a response today, if not yesterday, to a lot of these things. And I'm sure that by the time any of these changes we're thinking about now come into practice, there's going to be God who knows how many different problems that have yet to be addressed then that we'll be angry about as well. Well, that's what it feels like is going on now. I'm so sick of talking about this just like everybody else, but you almost can't escape it anymore. It's like a vortex, a subject vortex, which was is AI or machine generated. What I don't even like AI. Oh, you're it's telling so me every Wednesday night oh, I'm I feel, in Leo can I tell you how AI hole. <laughs> and I feel for you when, when I, I look, and let me just be clear about this. I, I have a lot of respect for Leo. I wouldn't have started a podcast without the fact that he really, and I think very, very intelligently, said this is a democratized media form where if you have an opinion, you can, I mean, don't get me wrong, it, it goes badly too. But, uh, so I love Leo. He's, he, he, you know, I've, I've followed him for a very long time. But this thing with him and AI, I, I sit there and I'm just, I'm baffled by the embrace of this thing with no 
what feels like desire for anybody to say, okay, wait, can we monitor what we're doing with this? Because it doesn't this just feel like the same thing we've gone through a bunch of times now? It is like, the same thing we've gone okay. through so many times that it's just like, why? I don't understand their position, which again and again seems to be, well, AI, any of these large language models and training models have the right to get their paws on everything. We should give them everything and we should give them everything for free so that they can be the smartest they can be. I'm like, why? There's absolutely no reason we need to do that. I don't need to give any corporation anything, much less all of my information, much less the body of my work so that it can be smarter in whatever way you define intelligence. I completely agree because I'm an artist and one of the things that I'm not anti any of this stuff, really, I'm like me and Aunt Pruitt have had discussions about this and we're kind of in the same place, very middle of the road where it's these tools, just like any other tool, have great benefits when they're applied correctly. It's it's the technology is amazing when it works correctly, but at the same time, I, I've, I've heard this and I think Leo said some version of this. Well, artists steal. So why shouldn't this thing steal from them? And I'm like, OK, all right. I, uh, well, artists are I'm, people yeah. that exist in the world rather than a privatized uh, training model owned by a corporation that is used for profit, I think is my official rebuttal to Leo well, there, on that. But there are also mechanisms for actual theft. If I start selling a video game with Mickey Mouse and I say Disney's Mickey Mouse in my game, <laughs> I am pretty sure a lawyer is going to find me at some point. So it, it's, you know, that's the other end of it is I, I the the wholesale vacuuming of creative input should at least be something that people have an option because there's plenty of people who love it and they're going to they're pour everything they ever made into it. Great. Go for it. You're free to do that. I'm not telling anybody they shouldn't have the ability to do that. But this complete we don't have any roadblocks for any of this stuff when it's almost where you don't think about the, 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 the consequences of, of what this stuff could do in turn. Like, Cause the, I read something where they said that it helps uh, cancer diagnosis where it's, it's massively helping and speeding up and identifying things that doctors might miss. Nobody's arguing against that. That's the stuff where I'm sure every doctor and, and patients will say, put all my info in there. If this will help me treat this, please. Who cares? Yeah, throw it in yeah, there. There's no downside. It. it gets right. more photos of cancer and not cancer. Cool. Yes. There, there's, of course, Bennett, but this is like, you know, AI is a hammer. It, you can kill somebody with it. You can build a house. It doesn't mean you should let a four-year-old run around kindergarten swinging a hammer all day just because, hey, it's a hammer. Well, it's a tool. What are you going to do? <laughs> yeah, do you so use I, AI at all in your day-to-day -day life? Honestly, I've, I've, cause most of what I do is Photoshop as you know. And so, Oh, do I know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, for people who don't know, I create a bunch of stupid stickers in discord when I'm watching, uh, this week in Google live usually just to annoy everybody. And so they're delightful. Uh, that's one word for them. But, uh, in Photoshop, there's a tool in there called Firefly, which is a, a machine generative image creator. And I've, I've used it a few times when I, when, there was one where I was trying to figure out, cause I, there's certain things where photo reference is not readily available. I cannot find many photos of like a, an ogre with a rubber chicken through its eye if I want to draw that as a joke image, right? That's something I'm <laughs> going to have to have created. So I've tried those, but honestly, and, and I like Firefly because Adobe seems to be trying to do this as ethically as possible. And people will say, oh, it has to be 100 or nothing. Nothing's 100 or nothing. Give up on that. You're living in an ideal fantasy world. It's gone. But they seem to try to make it where the art that's in there and the stuff that's being uh, generated is based on people opting in or at least, you know, granting some kind of access, which I think is as good as you can do. It's an effort anyway. Yeah. And the stuff it generates is 85 percent shit. It's not good. It's not it's not. Usable I mean, I think anything. most of those maybe I just haven't used enough good ones. I'm sure there are good ones out there. But whenever I use a art generation tool maybe i'm just bad at prompts but it fucking sucks it's never i somehow always have a prompt that is too complicated for it and i'm like all right i gotta go slap some stuff together in photoshop now well this is this is i hear a lot of people respond oh you're just not doing it right you just have to keep refining your prompts and it's like okay i can spend five hours to refine all these prompts or i can get just a, a basic thing and i can draw the rest myself in an hour so what am I, what is the accomplishing? It's not accomplishing anything for me. And I feel like, cause there's a lot of people say, well, 
you, the thing that you're you're being discriminatory because there are people who this allows them to create. Now, look, I want everybody to be able to express themselves. Believe me, I'm the first one to say, draw stuff, make music, whatever. Don't worry if it's good or bad. It's good for you, for your your mind and your body and your outlook on life. You should be creative. I think it's one of the, the great, it's a hippy dippy thing I say all the time. I love it. But at the same time, this is this is not that type of thing. Yes, if you put in a prompt saying, make me a cat with a birthday hat on it, it will do that. But that's not really you creating. That's not the same thing. It's like a shortcut. And it doesn't really allow you to develop a personal style and a voice and to really, at least in my opinion, really enjoy what creation is. And my co-host, who's a writer, he tried it. He he gave it samples of his writing and then told it to write some stories. And he said, you know, it, it, it crafted something functional, but you could tell that there's no soul to it. You know, and he, he read excerpts mm-hmm. on, I think, a couple of shows back. He actually read it out. Um, and then I think I put AI voices to it, which was funny. So, yes, <laughs> I used it for that because I made joke voices. But he said, you, you I love know the right AI away, voices, this actually. That's a very good bit, bit of an AI, I think. Yeah, well, there, there are good uses. But in general, it, it is certainly, I guess if you just don't know any different and it's better than nothing, I suppose that's you could say that. But would I put that poll quote on my AI tool? It's better than nothing. I don't think so. I think you're right on the money. I think that AI is an interesting tool. It has very good limited uses like most tools do. I think it's just ridiculous how overblown it's gotten so quickly that everyone is like, this is the future of everything. It's very reminiscent of when everyone went gaga for the metaverse last summer or whenever it was. It's just like, come on, guys. We know you're moving on. You're going to move on to a different subject to jewel in a couple of months or a year or two let's get to that point already well the other thing too is now we of course are finding out how much energy it consumes and the fact that you know this stuff is going to start costing a lot of money if it's sustainable at all they're going to start billing people a lot i don't care what they start oh well it's pretty i think opening has done it pretty inexpensively that's not a bad deal. it's not a bad deal today have you seen streaming services remember when they were a good deal holy shit five bucks a month and i can stream four thousand shows all day all night yeah how long did that last not that long you think these guys aren't going to come for their money yeah (laughs) it it it's astonishing how short our memories are for things because this feels like nft 2.0 i've seen that comparison other places oh absolutely right there where oh this is this is how artists will really make money and it's going to be better because of the blockchain remember the blockchain was the solution to every fucking problem in the universe yeah well you ever have any nfts god fucking no no i i good yeah you know (sighs) no fucking thanks more like it (laughs) And, and, I, and I always try to be really clear with this because there are digital artists and I've bought digital art. So this is not me saying that you have to do everything. I do most of my art digitally now. It used to be traditional media, I'm mostly on an iPad now. So I have every appreciation for digital art. That's not a different type of art. It's not lesser. There's no better, no lesser. It's all what you enjoy and what you like making. So this is not an anti-digital art thing. But NFTs were a fucking scam from the minute they came out because you didn't own shit. You didn't. Own it was a JPEG, baby. It was a JPEG of the blockchain. And it's honestly, I think it is a level of scam that I think is so blatant that it's kind of funny. Like the amount of thou- millions of dollars spent on NFTs. I mean, well, good for whoever got that money, I guess. But time, bad for the world. Every time somebody, one of these celebrities would complain that somebody stole my ape and then somebody would right click, copy, paste and put it in Twitter and say, here, I gave it back to you. Congratulations. Uh, Theft of I love it. it. It's, fuck, Never I, really that that era of Twitter where the ape guys were going ape shit to say the least was phenomenal. I miss that Twitter. God, that you know, it's funny when you. you, you I don't see that. anything like that on Twitter nowadays because it's just blue check nonsense. I barely even. The only reason I open it is because there are certain people there that that's the only way I can really. The DMing them is the only way that they exist you know because mm-hmm. i won't use facebook i just i won't use that at all um, yeah I, mean, I use instagram which is almost the same thing but it, it's still it's not uh but that's i mean every day it gets a little bit closer to facebook i feel like but it's not there yet yeah uh, well instagram is fucking miserable i i i really hate it as well but uh, a lot of my family's on there and they want to see my artwork so i'm like all right i'll put that's all i ever put on there i never put a picture of like hey look what i have for breakfast everybody Woohoo! you know because my breakfasts aren't that spectacular anyway, man. They're not. It's uh, Bellevue. You can draw a picture of your breakfast. That could be fun. I, 
yeah, I could do that. And that that's fine. So it's one of those things where I'm there because like a lot of these services, we're there because we have to be, not because we really enjoy anything. I still like yeah. Blue Sky because it's a wacko, you know, it's a psych ward. And so I like it there, but that'll get ruined. Speaking of, of which, Blue Sky opened it up, opened up invites. Wow. Anybody can get on Blue Sky now. Well, I, I'm glad they waited because I don't think anybody cares anymore, which is good because yeah. as I've told people, the best part about Blue Sky is it's weirdos, perverts, and artists. And I want it to stay that way. That's that's my <laughs> crowd. And I don't want, you know, uh, go to Mastodon if you want to talk tech and journalism. That's what that's for. Go to Twitter if you want to be a right wing nut job because that's what's that for. Facebook is for talking to your grandparents. And Instagram is for buying shit that you shouldn't buy because it's scrolled by you in 15 ads every 10 seconds. So... <laughs> You should reach out to Blue Sky, pitch them that as their uh, tagline, weirdos, perverts, and nut jobs. <laughs> it is not an exaggeration that that is the line I used to sell it everywhere. And it actually has worked. People have been like, really? I mean, like, that is, weird. I remember the week me and every other tech journalist joined Blue Sky, the posting energy was a level of feral that I feel like I have not seen since like the early days of weird Twitter. It was phenomenal. Yeah, and now it's kind of settled into a nice a nice sort of background hum, which I know, so, and this is another thing, this is this weird mentality now that technology or tech companies have, and honestly, shareholders in the stock market and everything else, have shifted us into where if it's not overly hyperactive and manically energetic, then it must be dying. Oh no, it's dying because somebody's not posting every five seconds. I don't know that that's really healthy. So maybe the fact that certain people only post once or twice a day and I don't have to keep it open all the time. I don't know. I'm kind of That's okay phenomenal. with that. That's yeah. phenomenal. Yeah. It's it's laid back, man, and I can use some of that shit. Laid back is fine with me. Which I know yep. is weird to hear a New Yorker say, but I'm kind of okay with laid back. Listen, uh, you're fine. a New Yorker in California. Of course you're going to be pro laid back. <sighs> Let me tell You've you. You've made days. your peace. You drive mm. a car. You've sold Love. out, man. Well, yeah, I, I do. I I. I it is still very obvious to people out here that I'm not from here. Let's put it that way. I don't know that I'm ever going to become a native. Let's put it that way. I don't care if I'm here for the rest of my life. I probably will be here for the rest of my life, but I don't know. <laughs> slanted parking slices. I just want to punch people. I, I just complained about this. Somebody. What the <laughs> fuck with these slanted parking spaces? I don't get it. I don't get it. Um, let me ask hey, you It's better else. than parallel parking. Yeah, what? Oh, I hate parallel parking, but I mean straight parking spaces. What is the difficulty? I'm sorry. What is the difficulty? Nobody can explain it to me. It's fucking baffling. <laughs> but let's get back to journalism because there was something that we talked about on our show a little while back. And, uh, and my co-host, oh boy, he, this, this bugged the shit out of him. But since you're a journalist, this, I'd be interested in your opinion on this. And I don't know if you saw this, but there was a Guardian piece about an accusation of digital rape in the UK. Did you see anything about this? No, I didn't. Okay, I, I could probably find it. But the thing that was, the discussion was not around the actual case itself, which sounds fucking horrible because, of course, it is because it's the Internet. Uh, but there was the thing that we were talking about, my co-hosts, um, where is this? What? Oh, okay, wait. Um, I'm looking at it. A girl was allegedly oh, raped okay. in the metaverse. Is this the beginning of yes, a dark that's it. new that's future? It. That's it. So the thing that's interesting, and, and, and I know you can't read the whole article while we're on here. I mean, you could because I'll just go on and on and bore you to death, but... The interesting thing about that, and this is to how journalism works, and I'm curious on, on how you struggle with this, is we, we got into, because I said, because he was very upset about the use of the word rape, because he said, well, rape is defined a very specific way. This is, this is not something I think can occur digitally. And I said, well, wait a minute. Let me look up what the definition is and how the UK defines it, because maybe their definition is different or maybe the legality of it is different. And what we determined is what it feels like the real problem is, is they use the word rape, but they also use the phrase sexual assault, which are often interchangeable apparently, or used interchangeably, even though legally, at least in the United States, they're defined very differently. And I said, well, I think my problem with this article is not necessarily that it's incorrect, but because there's no real definition of the terms that are being used, it can be misleading. So it mm -hmm. may be maliciously clickbaity written, or it just could be that this is not a very good way to use terms like this. Because that feels like to me the real problem is they're using interchangeable terms or the writer is using interchangeable terms that can be confusing. And I imagine you have to be very careful about that stuff where you have to be like, okay, I got to make sure I'm using because absolutely. I mean, I, mean, I think writer, so. my uh, immediate thought here looking at this is I think that 
what is unique about this article that is causing this issue is that this is an opinion piece by a regular columnist, Nancy Jo Sells, who, based on looking at her byline, seems to write like once a month about the topic of uh, relationships or sex related issues and the Internet. Um, so mm. as an opinion piece by a guest columnist, probably the bar for correct quote unquote language is a lot lower because a lot of uh, major news organizations kind of let their opinion columnists have free reign because, I mean, as we see with the New York Times often, kind of the job of an opinion columnist is to get people fired up in some way, either positively or negatively. So I think possibly because the subject of this artist of this uh article is it is kind of about is this really rape is one of the questions in it and is it correct to call something uncomfortable that happens to a child in an online world rape or by what name should we refer to it is part of the question i think that's why they probably use that language well, see, and this just proves that I'm a fool because I didn't even realize it was an opinion piece. I was so fixated on the, the terminology. I didn't even see that it was an opinion piece. I looked at it and I went, oh, OK, well, let me, let me see. see and I mean, I think out. that's part of the thing is like I don't think most people notice those sort of things. And I think that's kind of part of how opinion pieces work in major media publications is, you know, opinion is up there, but it's tiny in the top left corner and it's not really said again, partially because most for most readers that isn't necessary it's just what the content of the article is but i know that uh i guess the information has some opinion columnists but not many anymore but for a lot of my co like friends who work in larger publications with a big opinion desk like the wall street journal or the times this difference between news and opinion and often the l lack of distinction for the average reader is a big deal because it causes people to have like a what the hell like why is the guardian posting this article conflating a girl getting surrounded in a in the metaverse with gang rape well yeah because he, he was he was all fired up about it because he gets very hung up on language and stuff like that and i was and i was like all right let me take a minute and let me just see what we're talking about here but i completely missed the opinion piece part so i was more my kind of take from it was, yeah, I, I don't think this is a great use of these terms, but you're right. If it's an opinion piece and if the point was to generate anger, well, then mission fucking accomplished because he right? was hot right off the bat for that one. And I was like, okay, all right. I mean, we, we talked about it for a good, I want to say an hour because we were kind of you know going back and forth and different stuff. And I was saying that my problem is that, you know, I, I, I feel like there is a, that often, I don't care that language changes. I mean, I don't necessarily like, you know how words get abbreviated but guess what my parents didn't like shit i said when i was younger so that's the nature of being older <laughs> and being younger so that's fine my problem has been and i think this is kind of tangential if not directly related to the whole mixing opinion and news thing is there's less of a effort a lot of times to say okay this is what these terms mean so you throw a term out and just assume or don't care which is the bigger problem that people understand what it means even if it can have a very different meaning and you can apply this to anything. It doesn't have to necessarily be just this type of article, but it could be anything where if there's not a, a common, maybe a media vocabulary, and that goes into kind of the way that people aren't really raised to look at media and understand what, what's like, I didn't see it was an opinion piece. Now, although I can detect in two seconds when an article on a website is actually an ad where that little sponsored by thing is there. Like <laughs> I spot that yeah. shit immediately, but this went right by me. Uh, even though I, try to I don't, I don't know i used to say critically think about things but that term seems to be being co-opted now by <laughs> everything gets eventually everything is fucking ruined so it's like critical thinking is a a neutral term and yet just like free truth uh, what is it uh free speech absolutionist it's all getting it becomes <laughs> okay this is an excuse to just spew hate at people and be like hey, hey i'm just kidding i'm just critically oh, thinking here oh god yeah so yeah, that, that's fascinating because that's a real-time example. No, yeah, I do think I that your qualm about language, though, is a fair one. And I think that it's something that the media doesn't do a good enough job explaining their processes to readers. Like, for instance, at the information, it's a particular process because we're obviously 
writing for a very specific type of reader, writing for a reader who is in a specific industry and is able to and has decided to subscribe to our absurdly expensive publication to read about tech and business news. So there are certain things, you know, like that Alphabet is the parent company of Google and things like that that we don't have to explain. But a big part of the process is when you're working with editors and the editors above them and our copy editor who comes in to read it the last part, one of the common uh, comments and edits you get is like if you use a term or an acronym or some shortened thing to be like take a step back explain what that is to the reader or like let's put this in context and that is what a good editor or a second editor or copy editor should do but I think part of what has happened is as the media industry has gotten under more and more pressure you have all these different outlets fighting for your attention you have to put stories out faster and faster and a lot of outlets, your reporters, not much less the editors, don't have the sort of institutional support to be making those smart calls and putting that much thought into how they're presenting language and what words they are choosing when communicating with readers. And isn't that only going to get worse as media is just dismantled and destroyed and it becomes smaller and smaller teams sometimes doing work they don't really have the training? I mean, yeah, there are Absolutely, those... especially in the chat GPT universe of media, you know? I mean, it's not going to know how to do anything. Well, that's... that's And the other thing is this... When it, I don't want to get back into it. But the other thing is, if this stuff is all consuming itself, and this topic's been brought up by a lot of people who are concerned about it, you're, you're just going to have basically homogenized... It, reporting, writing, I don't know what you want to call it, but you can already see, it's, it's, I can't tell as much because I'm not a writer, so you would see this better than me, but certainly when it comes to image generation, I know right away when it's AI, nine times out of 10, I can tell, I'm like, oh yeah, that looks the same as 80 other things that look the same as that. So I, my immediate default is it's probably machine generated. And then occasionally you find somebody who you find out guess what, has done extensive work outside of the prompt to finish the thing and pretty it up and make it look different. But I would assume that you can probably, you would probably be able to discern artificial written articles because they don't write like people. They can't, right? I mean, it's going to stick out. Yeah, I mean, it definitely does. I think some of the tells, at least for ChatGPT, is like overly wordy, but not in a like, I feel like, people when they get wordy or write long they're trying to do something with it whether it's stylistic or over explaining a specific topic with a a particular human bent to it chat gpt and these other large language models have a very armchair perspective but yet they also over explain the simplest concepts because obviously they don't they don't know anything. They're simply basing their uh, writing off of just a corpus of work that they've seen before, and they have no idea whether or not it makes sense to over-explain what Facebook is versus what a neural network is. It's going to be raining today, so make sure you take your umbrella. An umbrella being a hand-operated device that will shield you from the rain, which is water that comes down from the sky and attempts to make exactly. <laughs> Cool. It's like, huh? <laughs> Strange. Wow. Okay. So you explained umbrella to me. Well, that's something that a normal person would need explained in such interesting detail. Okay, got it. Mm -hmm. um, well, you know what? Let's. Uh, I think this is a good place to wind up this particular segment. So we'll we'll bring this uh, part to a close, and then we're going to get into the fun stuff because I will try to avoid mentioning the letters AI or uh, tech apocalypse, which I managed to avoid till just now. So uh, we'll try Phenomenal. to stay out of that yeah, in the second part. So again, a reminder that you can find Paris's work over at The Information, which is just theinformation.com, right? Right. Also, yeah. And uh, you can see her more work and more background on her over at parismartino.com. So Paris, thank you for doing this first segment and we'll now pretend that some amount of time is going to pass. We'll pull the veil down. All right, everybody, we'll talk to you again in uh, a week. Talk to you then. Visit OzoneNightmare.com to subscribe to new episodes, browse through our back catalog, or to find links to support the show. Follow at OzoneNightmare on Twitter for the latest episode postings and other show information. If 280 characters just isn't enough, you can always email us, theozonenightmare at gmail.com. Music for Ozone Late Night is provided by Ogre. 
Visit ogresounds.bandcamp.com to hear and purchase his fantastic selection of music.